So they came to the continent of Africa via ships, so by their naval forces. And, you know, we have the key, two key players in um, the history around the transatlantic slave trade. But, and these were Sir Francis Drake and Sir John Hawkins. And Sir John Hawkins was known as the first Englishman to transport, you know, 300 Africans from the continent of Africa to England uh, in the latter part of the 1500s. And that's where the conversation around um, the British involvement in the development of the transatlantic slave trade begins. But Europeans have been circumnavigating the world since the uh, latter part of the 1500s. And as a result of that, their expansions going over to the Americas into the continent of Africa and over on to, into Oceania is something that has been systematic, but it's taken trial and error for them to be able to kind of get it right. Because when they were coming to the continent, there wasn't an understanding of what they could develop or how they could develop until they actually reached the shores of our continent. Well, we can't leave anybody out because everybody was following one another. So initially Spain and Portugal had the monopoly of uh, going out and starting the, the, this uh, trade war because essentially they were looking at what was available outside of our peninsula, outside of our remit to be able to benefit financially on the world stage. And they were hearing of all the things that were going on with the other European countries. And it was, how do we get in on it? How do we also benefit from this? And this is also looking at how they expanded over to the Americas by seeing the model that worked for the Americas allowed them to develop further models on the continent. But because they were dealing with different groups and different sets of people, the model had to be um, kind of reworked in a sense, and it needed time for them to develop, but they were looking to expand their empire. So the wars that they were having amongst themselves, they were able to have access to more materials, more food, more men, and try and develop their kingdoms separate from one another. When we look at the continent of Africa, we, we, we're not doing without anything. We have everything. And as a result, having everything creates a comfortable mindset where we don't actually have to fight for anything. And when you're coming from Europe, we, we look at the difference in weather, we look at the arid lands, we look at the the limitations around uh, language and, and the borders. You know, there are so many natural borders between countries where you're not, you can't even gain access. So when you look at the formation of England, 1066, and looking at the Anglo-Saxon and Dukes coming over, warring the Bretons, who already spent their years warring the Romans and warring groups of people who had come, the classification of England started on that day. And then when you look at them coming into Africa, that's only 600 years. 600 years gives us how many generations? 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 generations. And over time, the generations are now looking at what's happened before them. They are growing in size. They are growing in understanding. You know, they're developing their own uh, infrastructures around you, their universities, education, uh, trade, and looking at how not only to, to expand within, they're also trying to expand without. This country is known for uh, marrying women from Europe to be able to have a better union between the two because they fully understood that they were peninsula. They also had the Catholicism before, you know, Henry VIII changed the religion here in this country. So they were always depending on their relationship with Europe and how they were able to sustain themselves and their, their livelihoods as a result of that relationship. And it was through marriage, through the bloodlines, through religion, through trade, that they were able to do that. But as time went on, when we get to the 1500s and Henry VIII wants to now remove himself from that European Union, just as we have done now with Brexit, to be able to be more autonomous, have his own voice, to be able to, to be seen as his own God, to be seen as his own, as you know, as the own head of the banks, the head of their own finances, to be able to develop in a way that was more um, universally welcoming for the people on a peninsula that doesn't share the same culture with those in the, in the area of Europe that we know today. Mm -hmm.